Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to our latest issue edition of Rip from the Headlines. And uh, I guess it's our Pesach, our pre-Pesach edition, uh, before we break for the holiday. And uh, it's this time of year that uh, rabbis often get uh, more questions than usual uh, on all sorts of issues uh, relating to the upcoming holiday. And uh, in a conversation with a colleague, we were discussing what's the most common question. And, um, you know, I, I, I say that for me, I often get questions about koshering specific items uh, to be used for Pesach. Uh, the, the barbecue grill uh, often takes the prize. Uh, this year, the smoker was introduced into the, uh, the questions. Uh, some, uh, also a lot of questions about selling chametz. Uh, but also, you know, in particular, uh, with the preponderance of people who go away uh, for Pesach and leave before Arab Pesach, it's always a question, well, I'm going away. When do I search for chametz? How do I search for chametz? Do I have to search for, search for chametz? I say I'm closing the door and walking away and selling everything. Uh, what has to be done? So I thought we'd spend a little time about uh, discussing the search for chametz. The sources are linked in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and you'll notice that it starts with a picture. Uh, of a Bedikat Chametz kit. That's an illustration more than an actual photograph. And you'll notice it has some very familiar items. I don't know about you. I made sure to pick mine up early. Um, you know, there's certain Passover staples uh, that were all, used to be given out by different institutions as a, you know, as a incentive to give a, a charitable donation. So back in the day, Haroset was all the rage. You would get like a, a freeze-dried packet of Haroset from a particular yeshiva. You know, I think they made them all at once and gave them out over 20, 30 years. Um, and now that they ran out, they're not going to make it again. Um, but I think that that, uh, you know, certain yeshiva were connected, you know, old school, like the Lakewoods and the Lower East Side yeshiva and the like uh, would give the charoset. Sometimes it's the Bedikat Hamid's kit, uh, which also would be distributed in, in with a, an envelope as, you know, here's your kit. Now you can do the Bedikat Hamid's. Um, and as the, 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 the you know, the, the spoon, the feather, the candle. And as of late, that little pouch has 10 pieces of free wrapped bread. Um, you know, these days it's become a pretty big deal. You go to any Judaica store. I think the, the kit is a couple bucks, two ninety nine or something like that. For, for the prepackaged bread, I think it's like $6 or $8. You can like buy several loaves of bread still. Even with inflation, you can buy it for cheaper. But it's become kind of, uh, you know, pretty easy. You don't have to, you don't even have to wrap it yourself, uh, and uh, or any, and there's no chance of crumbs leaking out of it. But um, but this idea of there being this free package bedikah kit, it, it, you know, there's a certain expectation, like you know, how are you gonna have pesach without the spoon or the feather? You know, this may not be something that goes on in your family, but you know, we have a very uh, a, a, a long-standing tradition that you know someone's going to take the spoon and the feather, and uh, the candle has to be lit. And we're going to talk all about the different aspects as well. And since it's ripped from the headlines, I did find a a, a discussion from a, a writer in Tablet, source number one, a couple of years ago. You know me; I almost never write about products, but when a joy box showed up on my desk with its festive high-end design vibe, I was enticed. I'm not a paid endorser, yada yada yada. It's just cute. Joybox Club is a new subscription box service, a la Birchbox and Stitch Fix, the book and my personal fave, Gin Explorer, for Jewish holidays. The Passover version, beautifully packed, fun to open, and Instagram-friendly, contains a gorgeous embroidered Afikoman bag, a snazzily designed little Passover-themed card matching game, a clear plastic box of macaroons, a white mucilage bag with Afikoman finder prize stamped in gold on it, and chocolate candies inside. Packed with shiny gold cardboard pyramids to put together and use the CD cards, a your seder, and a Badika Hametz kit containing a candle, a wooden spoon, prepackaged gummy candy, a wee glassy and bag for your Hametz and a candle. Right? They kept it safe by using kidney out instead of Hametz to search for. And there's also a succinct explanation of the holiday. Right, So there's a little, it's, it, it's cultural, it's kitschy, the idea of a Badika Hametz kit. How does this all come about? So we'll talk a little bit about Badika Hametz. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the questions and some of the changes and you know, that may emerge based on the way we clean or go away. And then if there's uh, any questions, I'll be happy to take them. It all begins with the very opening lines of Masechet Sachim, source number two. On the evening of the 14th of the month in Nisan, one searches for leavened bread in his home by candlelight, Laor Haner. 
any place into which one does not typically take leavened bread does not require a search. So you have the idea of a search uh, with a candle or haner. Uh, and you at the same time, you also have an exception from the search. If you don't go there with chametz, it doesn't require a search. And the Mishnah goes on to list you know, how far back into a room where chametz may go, different types of rooms and the like. Also pointing out that the word for the, we learned the fact that it's evening because the, the, the Mishnah begins with or li arba asar, which technically means the light of the 14th. The light of the 14th, though, it means the opening moments of the 14th, which are at night and not by day. It's a whole discussion. The Talmud goes for a whole page about, you know, the usage of uh, language and how the Jewish day begins at night. And even when it's dark, we can still call it or. Okay, so that's the search. So why are you doing a search? We know that chametz is a toxic substance over the course of the Pesach holiday. And, um, you know, you can't eat it. You can't uh, own it. You can't benefit from it. You can't have it. Right? It, it, it's, it's treated very religiously toxic. That's why we clean it so much. And we've spoken about that before. So, but why do you have to search for it? So Rashi there says, you search for it. Shalo yavor You have to search for it so you don't encounter it. And then you would violate this additional prohibition of uh, 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 of seeing it or finding it in your possession. Right? The, the, we, you're not supposed to encounter your chametz at all over Passover. Therefore, you have to search for it to make sure that there's none of it around in order to go into the Passover holiday. Short, not to violate bal yira bal yimatze. So Tosfot right there on Sachim two a quotes Rashi's opinion, but says source number four. This leads to a difficulty, according to Rav Yitzchak the Elder. Since bitul, annulment of chametz is required. From the Torah, annulment is enough to avoid the biblical transgression. Why do the rabbis require searching at all? Right, one of the things that we say at the end of the search, we say it again when we burn it, we'll talk about burning also. Right, kol chamira v'chamia. It's this Aramaic declaration, which you should say in English if your Aramaic is not so good, in which we want all of it to be hefker ka'afradar, we want it to be ownerless. So the, that is considered bitul. We are nullifying it. I don't want chametz. I'm shouting from the rooftops. I don't want chametz. Any chametz I have is not mine. It's yours. You can have it. Hefger, batel, nullified. It, it has nothing to do with it. I don't want it on Pesach. So therefore, from a Torah perspective, annulment is enough. So why did the rabbis require searching at all? Right? What does it matter? If I say any chametz in my possession is nullified, then who cares what I may find in my house? I don't want chametz. So Tosfot says, it seems to the opinion of Rav Yisak the Elder that even though annulment is sufficient, the rabbis were stringent to require the searching of chametz and to destroy it so that no person should come to eat chametz on Pesach. We are extra worried about chametz. We are extra worried about chametz because if you encounter it and you may, you know, since all year long you're not from chametz, you encounter the chametz on Passover, even though you nullified it and you had the greatest of intentions before the holiday, you know, you'll see it, you'll take it, you'll put it in your mouth. There seems to be this kind of like an you know, oral fixation that we have with uh, chametz. We're always worried about it. We're going to stick it in our mouths. But since that's the case, so we want to make sure it's gone. Gone, gone. And how do you make sure it's gone, gone? You clean and you have to search to make sure every last vestige is gone. But this is a rabbinic stringency. It's similar to the way that we treat chametz much more seriously than any other prohibited substance. We, you're forbidden to get any benefit from it. Uh, it is uh, any small amount makes everything prohibited. So basically, Tosfot feels that the search is really there to ensure that we won't encounter the chametz, right? So you know, just to, to uh, jump ahead, can someone think of a, a, a of the if we follow Tosfot's rationale to the conclusion, where might there be kind of a, a leniency when it comes to searching? What situation may not require searching, based on what Tosfot is saying? And to put on your Gemara cups. All right, Toso says that we search out of a stringency that you might encounter it and you might eat it. Well, let's say go away for Pesach. I'm away for Pesach. I don't have any. I, I've left all my house behind. I've left all my helmets behind. Why should I have to search? I'm not going to encounter it. So we, we, we on the one hand, the, 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 the rationales, whether it be Rashi's, because you don't want to encounter it, or Tosfos, because you may find it, you want to make sure you're not going to even potentially, possibly, even a small chance, eat it. There would seem to open up a whole series of leniencies for not having to search if you're not going to be home. 
So uh, as it comes to the conclusion, when it comes to the, the halacha and the shulchan aruch, source number five, one searches all the places in which there is a concern that perhaps comments can enter it. Therefore, all the rooms in the house and upper floors, one needs to search, and sometimes a person can enter them with bread in one's hand. However, wine cellars in which one does not enter with chametz, and also in a straw shed or places like these, one does not need to search. So even though, so, if we're taking back what we have to do, where we're going to be, we have to make sure there's no chametz. In the places where we never take chametz at all, um, that are not places we go to with food, you also don't have to. Uh, you don't have to search. You know. So, for example, um, bathrooms. You don't have to search the bathroom, right? You know, it's not where you bring chametz, and you don't have to search your bathroom because chametz. You know, if they, like he says, you know, the, the the shed, the straw shed. Again, you know, I don't, is your garage like a straw shed? Maybe you don't have to search the garage. But at the end, where any place where you might take chametz, you have to be concerned about searching, and that's how we follow it because we're worried you might end up uh, encountering it over the holiday and then just mindlessly uh, noshing on uh, noshing on chametz. So the Magen Avram has, you know, interesting observation. Like we're, we're worried about this, you know, potential eating of something that we can't eat. So the Magen Avram says, if that's the case, and why didn't we just, why did they not say that one may not have non-kosher product in your home? Because what is accustomed to eating chametz, right? If we're worried about putting chametz in your mouth, why aren't we worried about you putting, you know, the non-kosher food item that you might have there for your non-Jewish uh, housekeeper or something like that? Why aren't we worried about that? So the Magen Avram says, look, one's accustomed to eating chametz throughout the year. It's just more natural that you may end up making a mistake mindlessly. You know, the non-kosher food is not something that you would normally eat. It's only things that we're worried that you might possibly eat that we're going to uh, have this extra um, concern um, and, and, and require you to clear out and search for and get rid of. So that's how, uh, that's the origin story of Bedikha Chametz. It's the Mishnah, the Gemara, the rationale. So you don't encounter it over the holiday. The halacha, you have to get rid of it. You have to get rid of it in places where the chametz may be. You have to search in those places. And really, it's just this kind of concern for the careless consumption of chametz that you might encounter over the course of the holiday. Stop there for any questions, comments, or reactions before unpacking into some of the exceptions. Okay. So... It wasn't long before some of the same reactions that we're having uh, were raised by you know, some of the early authorities, the Truma Tadeshen, Mari Weil, uh, you know, other, you know, some of the early, the Rishonim in the, you know, Ashkenaz communities, the Bali Tosfot in the early responsa started wondering, you know, about situations about, um, you know, look, you're searching for comets on the night of the 14th. That's great. But most people start preparing for Pesach in advance. It's a lot of preparation. And he begins by saying, Harbei, source number seven, People pray a couple, two or three days before. Now they substitute two or three weeks, two or three months. People start worrying about Pesach and cleaning. And by the time you get to the night of the 14th, there's no chametz left. So they put out Three or four pieces in a couple of the rooms. And they find these uh, pieces of bread as their kind of pro forma uh, search, right? So that, um, you know, so, but really, Shuv, Livdok, Shapir, Dami, Olav, right? If, if they're doing this pro forma search by just putting out a few. Uh, putting out a few pieces of bread, right? They clean the house. They know there's no chametz. Is this shop your dummy alav? Is this enough? He's like, you clean the house. When you clean the house, you make sure there's no more chametz. Why do you have to search again? Okay, you have to search because this it, Talmud says to search, but maybe just a pro forma search. A couple of the places where you put the chametz down just for the search. So the Truma Hadashan says, Yira de milta pshitahu delo ye ot inun avdi. They, that is incorrect behavior. That is improper behavior. You can't just have this pro forma fake search, right? The Gemara talks about that, that even if they already cleaned up beforehand, nevertheless, they still have to search again, right? It's not enough just to clean out the chametz. There needs to be a search. And, um, you know, the, the, the idea is there has to be a search on the night of the 14th. And as he says, he concludes, 
lechorin velistakin bechol chadre habayis shemachnisu melchametz. You have to do a full search, all of the cracks and crevices and all of the rooms of the house where chametz goes in. That's what you kind of search you need to do. So, uh, you know, Shuvar Adeshen says, you know, the rationale is we don't want you to encounter any chametz. Let's say you took uh, you did you did you did the activity of clearing out all the chametz. You still have to search. Shulchan Aruch, source number eight. One who cleaned his room on 13 Nisan with the intent to search and clear out any chametz and has been careful not to bring any further chametz to these locations. Let's say, you know, we were practically written down as practical on the Shulchan Aruch, must still search on the night of the 14th. You clean out the room, you know there's no chametz. You still have to search it on the night of the 14th. Rama, one must clean all the rooms before searching for chametz, as well as pockets or anywhere where one might place chametz. All these require checking. Cleaning and checking are two separate things. Doesn't matter that you clean. Doesn't matter that you cleaned and checked. The night of the fourteenth, you still have to check. So there seems to be a lot of duplication here. And uh, you know, I would say over the uh, subsequent centuries uh, since the Rama and the Shulchan Aruch, you know, brought down this as practical law from the Talmud, there's been some pushback. And the idea of, you know, are you really going to say that if you kind of, you know, you go through the room and you give it the white glove test and someone did a full inspection to make sure there's no chametz, you're really going to have to check every corner of that room in the Bidika. So Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Auerbach, uh, you know, from the late uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, to referenced the idea, Bizmanenu, source number 10. Now, we're cleaning the house as well in advance of the night of the 14th. Even though there's still an obligation that's separate for searching that's in place. You don't have to do extra uh, searching or lefash pesh means to investigate and, and, and check all of the places during the medika. El yidak dek v'yivchon heitev im kvarniku kol makom upina mechametz. We have to evaluate whether this was the type of a space that has already been cleared for chametz. V'im lav, yinakayu, if it hasn't been cleared of chametz, then now's the time to clean it. V'zu medika, so that's the, that's the checking. Uh, Shalom Zaman Arbach seems to say that over time, as our cleaning has become more intense, cleaning and checking have kind of merged. And therefore, if you see that a room is clean, you don't have to check. If you're not sure a room is clean, then you should clean it and check it, and that's what happens. So as an example, I would always say that um, often the night before Pesach, right, by the time you're getting there, the kitchen has already been kosher for Pesach. So if that's the case... The kitchen is kosher for Pesach, which means you've already cleaned it, you've already checked it, you've already koshered it, then you don't really have to check your kitchen on the but during the Bidikat Chametz that night because it's already a Pesach thicker room. Right? There's not going to be Chametz if you've been vigilant about ensuring there's no Chametz there from the time you turned it over into a Pesach. That's what I, that's how what, what Shlomo Zaman Arbach means. Yinakehu vizu Bidikato. Cleaning is searching. If you clean out the room, you've already searched it. If you're not sure the room is clean, then you do have to check it. It's this idea, you know, it's it's, it's like, uh, you know, we would always do, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, push my parents and my kids uh, to push, encourage them to push us. You know, you're going to put a little piece, one of the 10 pieces of bread right in the middle of the Pesach products, right? There's not going to be any pain. There shouldn't be any bread there. You went to the store, you brought it, it's still in the bags. How's there a piece of bread in my, you know, stop and shop bag that has my my, my machine mats in? Right. So, OK, you know, so Rav Shobu Zaman Arach is saying that there's some um, it's legitimate to say you don't have to check that type of uh, those spaces and you don't have to be as intense uh, as you once were, assuming the spaces have been clean. And so we've come, uh, you know, some would say we've come a long way, baby, uh, from, you know, the, the type of search that used to be done. Uh, you know, it's kind of you know, an answer to the question, how long should a search take? You know, you, you can't say it's just 30 seconds because that's way too su uh, superficial. But you're going to say it's got to take six hours. Right. I know I don't eat in bed. Do I have to check my bedroom if it was uh, if it was if it's cleaned regularly? So you, you have kind of a an evolution 
of the uh, the intensity of the type of search that's needed if you're in a space that you know has been cleaned out. So that is, uh, you know, one aspect of, you know, terms of, you know, it, you know, if you say that the title of this class is why do I search for comments if I already cleaned my house, there's an obligation to search. But as per Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach, you may not have to search as intensely. You don't have to search as intensely if you know the area does not have uh, chametz present. Uh, questions or comments? And then we'll move into a couple of the other scenarios that we raised at the beginning. All right, so what happens if you go away for Pesach and you leave before Erev Pesach? What's the status there? So the Shulchan Aruch addresses this type of an issue. The Talmud raised it. The Rishon have dealt with it. Hamifarish mi avasha layam, or yotze b'shayara. Right, you're going to sea or you're going on a journey. And there's no one who's going to search your house at the right time. Zakuk, leave Doki, you still have to search. So you see a couple of things. You might be away, but as long as someone is in your house the night of the 14th, they can do the search for you. And if no one is there, this still requires a bedika, assuming it's within 30 days of Pesach. And the Ramah adds, Velo yivarech az al but there's no bracha because it's not the right time. Uh, for 30 days, you're outside of the realm of preparation for Pesach, so you don't have to search. Obviously, wherever you are, uh, on Erev Pesach, you know, uh, if you're in the middle of your journey, you should still say the B tool or any comments that might be in your possession. And uh, of course, if you go away and you're spending time in a different place before Pesach and you're there, let's say, you know, you go, people, many people are going to be going away for Pesach this year before the weekend. They're going to be spending a Shabbos in a different place. So they're going to be for Pesach. Well, guess what? You have a new obligation of wherever you are to search on the night of the 14th, right? The the Bidika, if you're in a place long enough to have had your own chametz, then uh, you have to search yourself. Uh, you know, if you, you know, in theory, you know, uh, are, you know, if you did your, you know, let's say you did your search uh, on, uh, you know, this Thursday night before going out of town on Friday and you spend the weekend in Pesach with relatives, you obviously don't have to search their house for them. You know, so whatever type of obligation you have to search on the night of the 14th, they're taking care of it because it's their house and they're responsible. You want to participate a little bit, that's separate. But the idea of it's really the night of the 14th that has the obligation uh, for a bracha. If you leave any time within 30 days, you should search before you go. Um, you know, obviously that search can be very different because, as we said originally, and we'll look at it again, you're never going to count to that because you're not going to be there. But, uh, you know, so a, a search should take place. A bitzel should be recited. Um, and again, if you're in a new location, well, the, 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 the laws are reactivated in that new location uh, the night of uh, the 14th. Um, what about other spaces? You know, you know, what about the car? I you know there's that old joke about does a car need a mezuzah? So their car does not need a mezuzah, but does a car need a search? So Rabbi Shalom Zaman Arbach uh, addresses the subject in source number 12, Michonit. You should check it on the night of the 14th, ideally. Um, but he says, You choose a flashlight. And this gets us into the whole discussion of uh, getting back to our Bedikat Hamid's kit, the candle. So, first off, again, the car would be the type of place if you know that the, if there's Hamid's in the car, then you either clean out the car, and if you clean out the car, that was your search, and then, then you probably don't have to search the car that night. But it should be part of your bedika. Any space should be part of your bedika, especially space that you have access to the evening of the 14th. You know, things like your office and the like. If you're not going to be there the night of the 14th, so before you leave for the day, um, well, you know, this year will be a Sunday, but before you leave for the last time in your office, you can do your uh, necessary bedika then. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, drive back Sunday night. But the idea of checking the spaces where the chametz is, and again, the caveat of depending on whether chametz is there or whether it's been cleaned out, how much of a search needs to be done, as we said before. But here, Shlomo Zalman Arbach introduces the idea of using a flashlight. Right? And he says, Don't use a candle. Because, you know, if you have a little candle, and, you know, you're not, who, who, you're not really going to go under your seats with the candle because you don't want to set fire to the seats or burn the seat or burn your finger or anything like that. And this touches upon the fact that the Gemara, uh, as we saw, introduces that the search should be done, or haner, the candle. The Gemara goes on to describe it has to be a candle and not a torch, because a torch can lead to more fire. 
and um, you you wouldn't be as uh, willing to put the torch into the corner as unless you start a fire. If you're going to start a fire, well, what about the, if the candle starts a fire? But you know, what are you going to do? Remember, the Gemara is talking about it, you're searching at night. Back then, they didn't really have much light at night if it wasn't the candle, and the candle was the safest option. So that's what they used. So the question going forward is: when you do have light, more light at night, isn't it better to, for example, leave the lights on than darken the entire room and just use a candle? Um, so, and we see from Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Arba's comment with regard to the car that absolutely use whatever will allow you to search uh, best. Uh, to 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 to, to uh, that, that's what should be used, um, you know. But let's go back to our kit. Our kit has that candle. It shows the power of tradition that the candle still gets used, um, and uh, they, 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 everyone talks about using the candle unless the candle is not effective, unless there's better light. Uh, you know, it's the, the power of tradition that the candle still is encouraged. I know in general, you know, f following these guidelines, searching with the lights on is a very good idea. You know, but sometimes under the bed, you can be able to see without additional light. You know, there, there was a time the flashlights were used. Now we live in a whole new generation. You, everyone has their phone. You can turn the flashlight on the phone on uh, to check. Um, I, I'm a sucker for tradition. We always light the candle. Uh, say the bracha of Abir Hametz and then blow out the candle and do a badika with flashlights and lights on in the room. Uh, it almost has like a like a Hanukkah uh, lighting feel to it. But uh, the, the the real the goal is to do the search properly and effectively. Uh, if that's no longer a candle, then uh, use the other forms of illumination that will be helpful. So you know now now we talked about. The search, the rationale, the exceptions, the timing going away, the can we're unpacking now the Badika Khamit's kit. We talked about the candle. <clears throat> so what about what about the wooden spoon? Right? You know, you gotta imagine there's gotta be reason, you know, there's certainly nostalgia, there's certainly tradition. There's gotta be reason how that like this, you know, this this packet of the, you know, the candle, the wooden spoon, the feather, it keeps, you know, persisting into the 21st century. So for that, we have to look at the that we know that the search is a part of, it's not about the search per se, it's about getting rid of the chametz. And that's why the bracha that's recited over the search is al biur chametz, which means to get rid of, to destroy the chametz, because this is now the beginning of that process of looking for the chametz so that we can get rid of it and we get rid of it the next day. And we don't say bracha when we actually burn it. Um, and, and, and the question is, do you actually have to burn it? Right? You know, the, we, we we're familiar with, the burning of the chametz and you know the, the complication when Arab Pesach falls on Shabbos what do you do when you're not allowed to burn can you flush the toilet can you throw in the garbage the garbage cans are on your property which is a, you know an issue with regards to in general with regards to you know chametz you know th there are those who you know you know you throw chametz out in your garbage well what do you do with your garbage your garbage isn't collected till the second day of Pesach right this year you know uh, those of us in Atlanta Beach who works out very well Garbage collection is Monday, you know, so they'll take it Monday, and that's uh, Arab Pesach will recover. But what about people who don't have garbage collection on Monday? They have it on Wednesday. What are they going to do with the hummus in their garbage for a couple of days? So, you know, as we've mentioned elsewhere, if you're not going to eat it, you don't have to clean it. It's out in the garbage. What 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 bitzel, What more bitzel is there than garbage? Um, although there are people who, you know, make a point of uh, – Finding other places to to, to dispose of it, uh, bung, uh, dumpsters in uh, you know in, in, in shopping uh, centers or thrown in front of the non-Jewish neighbor's house. You got to be you know a, 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 all, all I can say from you know various experiences of my in various stages of life. It's a little bit weird to be you know going to the bank and throwing the your garbage in the dumpster in the back of the bank, you know, and all of a sudden you know the police car driving by is wondering what the heck's going on here, but. Everyone has to find. I think that uh, throwing out your garbage uh, is the be is a very clear form of bittel, but it seems that fire is preferred. Fire burning the chametz means to really burn the chametz. So Shulchan Aruch, source number thirteen. How is chametz destroyed? Burns it up, or crumbles it up, or throws it into the wind, or casts it into the sea. Right. So there are other options, and the whole cast into the sea is where you get the idea of flushing the chametz. Uh, down the, the toilet, especially on Arab Pesach Shabbos. If the chametz was hard and the sea would not cause it to break up quickly, he must first crumble it up and then throw it into the sea. Right? We don't want this chametz getting back to you any way, shape, or form. It's got to be gone. So if you're casting it aside, you don't want the piece of bread coming back in your face. And the Ramah then says here, but the custom is to burn it. 
And, you know, we're a very traditional people, and the, 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 the custom is to burn it. Burning stands out as preferable. You know, obviously, be careful, right? This is the time of year, the couple times a year uh, that, uh, you know, when there are large Jewish communities, the local fire department always issues instructions, right? Those in the New York area are familiar, may be familiar if you're from, you know, Brooklyn. Uh, they, they always issue these instructions in Yiddish because there's a lot of fires going on. You know, there's times of the year where this happens. Hanukkah, right? don't leave those Hanukkah lights alone. Uh, and uh, Pesach, you know, watch out when you're burning the chametz, right? You got to be very careful if you're going to be burning. That's why it's very convenient, those places that have kind of uh, places you could drop off your chametz, have it burned for you. I remember when living in Manhattan, that was especially a welcome thing because, you know, where are you going to be lighting a fire in Manhattan? Uh, even in small places here in Atlantic Beach, right? They have the village chametz burning. Drop it off. They'll take care of it. Uh, and it will be burned uh, without having to worry about uh, you know starting your own fire and extinguishing it, etc. So you're supposed to burn it. Now, if you add that Rama to uh, another detail, you know, you know, we've been talking about the expectation that you're going to find bread because we put out the bread. But on some level, these searches were done without bread. And the Rama says, source number fourteen: if you don't find chametz during the search. You should burn the vessel you were using during the search so as not to forget the obligation to burn. Right? You said a bracha, I'll be your chametz, because you're starting that process. Now, some say we put out the bread so that that blessing is not in vain. Now, technically, it's not required. That blessing is not in vain because we are engaging in the process of getting rid of the chametz, whether we find it or not, you know, whether there's what to burn or not, we are getting rid of our chametz. The Ramah says that there is the practice of, if we don't find the chametz, to burn the vessel that you're using to search with. And uh, generally speaking, that would the assumption is that you're, you're, you're using something wood because otherwise it's not gonna burn. Also, what else would they be using? So the idea emerged, the wooden spoon kind of becomes this special cleave, this special vessel that takes on significance that if there was no chametz, you'd have to burn, the, you'd have to burn what you used to search for the chametz. So having a wooden spoon on hand as that backup burning object uh, is part of the searching for chametz process. So therefore, uh, the wooden spoon is part of the kit. Uh, the candle, or haner, the Talmud says. Light of the candle. The spoon, well, the spoon's going to be, be important because if you don't find any chametz, uh, if you don't find any chametz in your search, you're going to have to burn the object you're searching with. You may, if you're going to have to burn that object you're searching with, well, then guess what? You want something that burns, you're gonna want a you're gonna want a wooden vessel. So um the, the the kit now requires the candle, the kit has the spoon. What are we missing? The feather, right? And you know, I I I admit that we probably take it a little crazy that anytime we encounter a piece of bread, we whip out the spoon, we whip out the feather. What's the feather supposed to be? You know, you it's the it's the feather duster, right? It's the broom. Why a feather? Where does it come from? Why does it have to be a feather in the kit? So it, it could have been what the brooms were made of and the like. And there is actually one mention of a feather in the halachic literature that comes with regards to the search for chametz. The Magen Avram. Right? Magen Avram is Rabbi Avram, Abla Gombiner, 17th century uh, commentator on the Shulchan Aruch from Poland. And, and you see there in uh, the final source, source 15, Sarich Lechabed. Right, you have to, you know, clean. The low mivdik shapir below kibud. Right, that uh, searching doesn't work without cleaning. That's, you know, part of what we said is the transition into how, you know, Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach talked about that the cleaning is really one of the main points of the searching. If it's clean, it could be it could be, be viewed as searched already. But v'lachei nagu lito notzot ulechabed. Therefore, since you have to clean. Part of the cleaning of you, the custom was to take notes out. A notes, notes is a feather. The custom was to take feathers and use that to clean. And that was part of your, that was part of your, uh, that became part of the search process. So we have in our bags, the candle or haner, the spoon as the vestige of what might need to, this is what might need to burn the object if we don't find the chametz. And now, even though we have the chametz, we still burn the object and the feather at least for the last, you know, 350 years or so, has uh, been part of the tradition of the, the cleaning and ensuring that things are uh, clear of chametz for Pesach. So the uh, feather makes its way into the bag uh, as well. 
Uh, and so at the end of the day, we search for chametz if you already clean the house. Major tradition, the severity of the chametz, part of the preparation for Pesach. Uh, we've seen that over the centuries, you know, the fact that we clean differently and live differently may impact our need for the searching. Going away uh, clearly changes our need to search. There should be some form of search before going away. Uh, and the kit, you know, it really uh, has a certain amount of nostalgia attached to it. And uh, something tells me if they replace any of the objects in the kit, I certainly wouldn't be interested in buying it anymore. So um, that's also part of how uh, tradition continues. So uh, I hope this has uh, been uh, uh, illuminating and interesting. And uh, if it uh, makes your Pesach preparations any easier, great. If it doesn't, also great. Uh, wishing everyone a uh, wonderful Pesach holiday. Thank you. Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Chag Kasher V'Sameach to all. As I, always like to explain, as I always like to explain that tradition, right? Chag Kasher V'Sameach is for people going away for Pesach because they're going to be relying on someone else's or a hotel's uh, kosher food. <clears throat> you hope that it's kosher. If you're at home <laughs> and you can control your kashrut, we just hope for a Chag Sameach that it'd be happy yeah. enough with all the extra work. Thanks, Samaya. And that's how